So perhaps we should talk first about, Fiona, how you describe yourself as an artist. Um, just a fairly potted history of where you've been and your practice. Yeah, I, I've been an artist for over 20 years, so um, that's how I identify myself and I work nationally and internationally and have been invited to many places around the world representing Australia as an artist. And uh, I studied at art school to have the type of career that I uh, started out in Sydney and it's taken me to many places I never dreamed of. So um, how did it all start? Did you always think you might become an artist or was it more an evolution of your interests? I think I started to take an interest in my great uncle's book, um, Uncle Wolfie, who wrote The Legends of Mooney Jarl, and it was il illustrated by my great auntie. They were brother and sister. And I was fascinated by her drawings of um, some of the legends inside the, the publication, how the bat f um, came to be upside down and Yindinji and some of the other characters, Milong, the evil spirit type person. and. That fascinated my imagination. I was in primary school and I remember uh, copying the drawings and I had a real affinity with that work because it felt so much a part of my being. Uh, and so, and then being influenced by other aspects of my culture at the time and I wasn't academically gifted at school, so I think that played a big role. And I remember finishing my HSC at Asquith Girls High and doing year 12. And a part of years 11 and 12, I took three unit art and we studied architecture. The girls in the class decided that, you know, part of our art theory would be architecture. So as I uh, left art school, I've also developed an interest in arch architecture. And when I left high school, I went straight into um, East Sydney Technical College, did two years and three years at Sydney College of the Arts and then a Diploma of Education at Sydney University. So it was six years tertiary study straight. Mm. And while I was there, I got to go to a number of commercial galleries. And I remember one in particular, I went to Rosalind Oxley Gallery when she was in um, Paddington, not the address now, but the other address. And um, I had this like little premonition and the work on show was um, Dale Frank and, okay. I, and the premonition came to me that one day I'd be showing in this gallery. And when I finished art school, it was about in 87 and then 88, I was a part of uh, Bumali Aboriginal Artists Cooperative. And while I was working away, I had um, the option of choosing between two commercial galleries. One was Rosalind Oxley and the other one was Maori Gallery and Rosalind came to Pamali and had a look at my, the drawings I was doing and I was a little bit flippant with her and she came up the stairs and she had a look through and she goes, um, I said, oh, these are dugong bones and she said, what's that? And I said, well, if you don't know, don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> I was 24. <laughs> and, she, and she goes to me, so how old are you? I said, 24. And she goes, oh, well, you're a bit young, I'll take you on. And I thought, okay. And I had my show with her, my first solo in 88 with these drawings. So, uh, sold out first night, opening night, and I've never been able to repeat that since. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that was like starting off. And That's I remember was, um, a lot of people came to the opening that night. And people like, I think, Julie Ewington was even there. She wasn't in Brisbane at that stage, but um, it was pretty... Uh, pretty awesome night and I didn't understand you know like the the bigness of it I yes. was just like going along with this wave it's something you'd only appreciate really yeah. in retrospect yeah yeah um, about yeah and I reflect back that. on that interaction with Rosalind I thought geez you were cheeky <laughs> you know <laughs> she must have said yeah. something <laughs> yeah that she knew she needed to have yeah um just to go back a little bit um was being indigenous an important part of your childhood? You, um, you know, I know some people it's, it was an issue that was suppressed but your mother was a proud bachelor woman from... It wasn't really, you know, when you look back now, it wasn't really a big deal. We just knew who we were and we grew surrounded by it. But what was, uh, what I appreciate now is my father who's non-Indigenous, like 
I just took it for granted that you spoke bachelor in the home. Mm. And I didn't realise like until later, like how unique my father was because, you know, we grew up with him appreciating my mother's culture. So he would talk to us in bachelor and I just thought, well, that's the norm. Mm. And uh, it wasn't until much later that I thought, God, you know, not most husbands will embrace their wife's culture to that extent. Yeah. And he fully embraced mum's culture. He certainly was um, a man ahead of his time. Yeah. And to this day, my father, you know, still speaks, you know, fondly and highly of our culture and, you know, ha has uh, such a, he's got a good intellect and he understands, like, how important Aboriginal culture is, you know, to his children, but also to the broader uh, Australian community. You know, mm. if we accept Aboriginal people fully, then we'd have a better relationship with Aboriginal people in this country. Yes, yeah. yeah. And so talk to us about the, um, your early experiences on Fraser Island. I was just bliss and uh, you would just get lost in this world for a whole month. You, we, we'd be over there and um, then we sort of, once Dad got a four-wheel drive, second, four, second hand four-wheel drive vehicle, uh, we would go across this more of family unit and we'd do a lot of fishing and it was just bliss in the beginning because there was hardly anyone there that was untouched and a tourist hadn't discovered it. Mm. So when we were young, we used to hear a, a vehicle go past down on the back beach and we'd run over the sand blow and wave to the vehicle <laughs> because they were that rare. So it's sort of a very different place back then to how it is now and you could have campfires and um, you can't do that anymore. It's very restricted parks. You can only have a fire in certain places on the island. So mm. it's much more controlling today if you go to the island. Mm. Yeah. And what sorts of stories would your mother tell you about, um, that, you know, that she was aware of from about the place? Oh, she used to, we used to collect a lot of uh, pippies. In our language, they're called wongs or properly they're called wawongs and so mm. we'd sort of um, remember sort of some of the creation stories related to that or how the coloured sand came into being. Um, it's just um, a total experience because you're on country and so you're doing things that, um, so we'd go to like Lake Mackenzie and mum said, oh, your grandfather swam across to the other side and so, you know, there would be stories that would pop up in the conversation and then my uncle Horry would come across with us sometimes and there'd be more stories added to that layer um, about my um, grandfather, my great grandfather, who was a bullock, had his own bullock team on Fraser Island when they were cutting the timber. Mm. So there's like a history of um, my great grandfather with his old, own bullock team with some of the names for the bullocks in that particular um, team. and. Are just fascinating and then my grandfather's little bits and pieces about my grandfather who was in the fishing industry and um, had his own boat and so it was sort of like all mixed in together. You mentioned that there was often a sense that you were being watched and that your mother's um, uh, view of that was that it was the old people that had passed on and that you know the sense of really being a continuous generation of involvement with that particular place? Oh, it's very strong, you know, growing up, uh, um, going to Fraser Island, you have a sense that you're being watched all the time. And, you know, it's like our ancestors who've gone before us, so we just refer to them as the old people. And many Aboriginal cultures would understand what I'm talking about when we refer to the old people. It's the people who've uh, passed away and who are watching over us now. And so, like, you're mindful that that they're there mm. in that role, and it's it's not it's not a figment of your imagination. It feels very real to us, and that you carry on a, a responsibility as a custodian. After art school, you got very involved with the Bimali Arts Collect Collective, um, which, of course, was in retrospect again such an amazing group of people: Tracy Moffat. Hedy Perkins, Michael Riley, yourself. Um, can you just talk us through uh, how you met those people and how that cooperative came together um, and what was its crucial function in terms of really helping progress your work? 
there was about five of us who sort of liked the idea of coming together. So there was Jeffrey Samuels, Avril Quayle, myself, Michael Riley and Fernanda Martins, who were probably the first five people. And then people knew of um, Raymond Meeks and there was uh, Tracy Moffat who came on board, but for, for a very short period of time. Roman Bancroft, Euphemia Bostock, and the last person to join the group was uh, Brenda Croft. And some of us were still studying at Sydney College of the Arts. Definitely I was Brenda Croft and Avril Quayle. And we, as, because we were operating as individuals, we knew the system was op also operating against us and our voice was not, was being drowned out in, in the studies and the art scene in Sydney. So we thought to get more strength, we needed to come together as a, as a group and that's how we could take on the establishment. Mm. But while we were doing that, so we had our first opening in 1987, it was November, and uh, John Newfong, who's a journalist, opened the show, and we kicked it off with a show called Bamalia Go Go. Mm. And it was just a wild night, <laughs> and um, Charles Perkins was there, and other sort of celebrities from around Sydney at the time came to the opening night. And then we sort of thought about like, how do we want to represent ourselves? And we wanted to get our work inside the establishment, like the Art Gallery of New South Wales and some of the key commercial galleries. We wanted to have shows that we curated. We wanted to talk about our own work in our mm. own language. And we wanted to develop a way of looking at um, urban Aboriginal art that hadn't really been focused on before. There had been Aboriginal art galleries, but they were focusing on artists from Arnhem Land and Central Desert. So they didn't really know how to slot us in. Mm. But we didn't really understand that we were making history at the time either. And, but we did have like a, like a fire in our belly to make a difference, to make a change and to say things that were a little bit um, controversial or mm. to challenge people's perceptions of what Aboriginal art is. Yes, yes. But we had to fight for a space because we could have been very easily overlooked yes. if we didn't come together as a group. Yeah. You have become, or urban Indigenous art has become such a movement in its own right. And a really important part of that for you, I feel, is probably the, the idea of, you know, incorporating the political message in your work. Do you think that came out of that time or was that it, uh, something you learned in art school as well? Or is that Fiona Foley? That, that's who I am. That's, uh, you know, I have a real strength of character and my father sometimes refers to me as a vo walking volcano. <laughs> <laughs> With a great sense of humour. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, it's just there. I have a, a strong sense of um, justice and wanting the history of Australia to be told honestly. And so when I unearth these hidden histories, I, uh, I really like researching in that way, but also I get a pleasure out of an audience seeing that work and not knowing this particular history. And then sort of for them, this sort of aha moment where they see something about their own culture and their own um, sense of what Australia is. And it can be jarring to them to un uncover some of these histories, like at the State Library of Queensland, when I, where I'm talking about the use of opium in Queensland and how rife it was right across the state from, you know, the state government issuing licences to the lay person who was um, distributing it in the, in the districts. Mm. And there were many opium dens in Queensland. I just wanted to ask you what it is that drives you to take on some of those really tough issues. I guess I have a real love for what I do and I have a love for Aboriginal culture and I see the richness that's around us here, like in the totality of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people making art today. And I think uh, we need to be acknowledged and the silencing needs to stop and mm. 
we need to be included in major cultural events here. And the way to do that is to have a conversation with us and bring us into these um, important cultural spaces like South Bank, the cultural precinct, and showcase our work and be proud of Aboriginal culture and showcase us to the rest of the world because it's very unique what we have here and we should be proud of Aboriginal people and their cultures. And so uh, when I take on fights about public spaces and public art, it's really for the betterment of Australian society that I do that, that we embrace the richness that exists here. I mean, we're such an intelligent society, we should be um, embracing uh, the history that's here and, you know, moving on from some of the past brutalities that took place in this country. And so it sort of comes from a pl place of deep love and empathy for what has occurred here, but understanding that um, the culture that, as it exists today is very rich. When you've been involved in those sorts of um, public discussions and then you may then not be invited to things or to go to things and not be spoken to. How does that make you feel personally? Is that, it, that must be tough. Makes me feel like a rebel with the cause. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it just excites me. I just thought, <laughs> you, know, you know, they can do whatever they like, but it's at the end of the day, um, a good colleague of mine says, just keep working. Mm. And that's what I do. And I'm on to the next project and I'm feeding my intellect all the time. I'm reading and researching and um, thinking about the next project and how I can do it better and what do I want to say this time and what do I want to research this time and how do I want to articulate that visually and how should I go about uh, com communicating that to an audience? Do I want to do it photographically or do I want to do it in film or do I want to paint about it? And I just think like the world is such a huge stage. Like I've been, you know, people can play silly little mind games with you, but I get these uh, wonderful opportunities overseas where I've been invited to give the keynote in London later this year for a huge international indigenous festival called Origins. And that work came about, I mean, the director of that, Michael Wallings, he approached me because of the work I did witnessing to silence of all things. And when he gave the keynote two years ago, he talked about that work That's of amazing. mine. And so, um, you know, it may be jarring for some people here, but on the world stage, people just embrace me. So last week you spoke at the opening um, at GOMA of I Still Call Australia Home. Um, so how did that feel to be invited to speak there? For the first time, I think. Yeah, well, I made the point um, that it was the first time I'd been invited to speak at GOMA or Queensland Art Gallery, and I had waited a long time. And uh, it felt good because, um, you know, when I do speak in public, I use it as an opportunity to bring new ideas um, to the public um, stage. And so I was speaking about country and um, raising different types of issues in the in the presentation that I gave and so yeah it was nice to be sort of acknowledged after living in Queensland for 17 years. So you mentioned that you're going to London to show your, ne your next project. You could you just talk to us about um, what the content of that is and um, how you're going to manifest it this time? Well the content's top secret <laughs> <laughs> but I can give you some hints. <laughs> It's going to be a new DVD. It will be titled Vexed. Is it the second DVD? Second produced? DVD yeah. I, I would have made. Yes. I'm using the same filmmaker from Tasmania who did Bliss. Mm. His name is Troy Melville and I have a nice working relationship with him. So I'm flying him from cold Tassie up to Alice Springs and we're doing the work in a couple of weeks and there's going to be a, a crew around um, working on it. But it's based on about nine quotes from, the work's based on nine quotes from Jermaine Greer's book called On Rage. Right. And it's looking um, 
a little bit of a hint. It's looking at, at traditional promised marriages and the breakdown through colon the colonisation process of those traditional marriages and um, the kin kinship structure. So it's looking at that a little bit and the metaphor for this particular work won't be opium poppies, but it will be black cockatoos. And why black cockatoos? It's because they mate for life. There's a strong sense of beauty with my work and you're lulled into false sense of security. So the birds will be the metaphor for that lulling into this false sense of security. But the words spoken from Jermaine Greer's publication will be hard hitting. I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about Dispersed, which I saw um, in the new Indigenous Hang at the NGA recently. I think there's so many key historians around who've had works published and sometimes I buy these publications and that particular year I read two publications and both of them overlapped in terms of like how the government reporting was being done on the native police and the people who were in charge of the native police and these words kept coming up because they didn't actually want to use the words that had taken place where they'd killed or massacred Aboriginal people so they in government reports it was spoken of in terms of disperse, dispersing and dispersal. And I thought, I was by myself here, and I thought wouldn't it be great to highlight that particular word, dispersed. And so I went to Urban Art Projects and I asked if they could help facilitate the making of that work and the brothers, Matt and Daniel, were very um, supportive. And on the D, I knew I wanted it to be highlighted differently with 303 bullets and so we worked out a way of attaching them to the first letter and as a, like a lot of this work I make it but I'm not really sure of the impact of it on the general populace so I um, you know it takes a while for me to understand like that's a very powerful piece of work and so it is in an important institution, the Australian National Gallery, and it, when you go up the escalator, it's one of the first things you can see on your right. And so it has a prominent place um, in the heart of this nation, in the capital city. And I'm really thankful for that because it's um, one of my um, signature pieces, I guess, as an artist. And that potency that I have with art and politics is clearly illustrated in that work and there's no getting away from it when you see that work. Um, you know, it's talking about um, massacres that took place here in, in Australia through the reporting, these government reports that tried to cover them up. I just wanted to ask you about, um, you know, the role of your mother in encouraging you and really propelling you on this journey. She used to have some, my mother used to have some classic sayings for us kids and um, oh, I can remember a lot of them. She, she used to say to us, you can't fight them with boomerangs and spears anymore. So it meant that we had to get an education and com compete on an even level. She encouraged that, um, that lifestyle that I was leading as a, a single person and, and taking off here and there and speaking at different places and then I'd come back home and I'd sort of say I would you know talk about the culture from that particular country like Chile or South Africa or Japan you know and it was just like way out there I suppose so I think she lived a little bit of her life through her children and their life experiences and she used to say to me you know if I got a little bit smart with her she you would say you didn't you didn't come from a hollow log. <laughs> <laughs> Which is absolutely right, because she also um, took on her own causes and fights, and she really was a fairly early um, achiever in terms of getting land rights. Oh, she was very determined to get some land back on Fraser Island, and she got a 20-year lease of the then Joe Bielke-Peterson government. Wow. And the aim was to build an education and culture centre called Thorgine Education and Culture Centre. And I just watched her for 20 years plugging away at this dream. And it was just like a huge eye opener because the whole family were sort of involved, you know, watching my mother 
achieve this goal and she achieved it. So as an artist, many artists focus on one art form, but um, that's not enough for you, Fiona. <laughs> There's paintings, drawings, prints, sculpture, public art, and now your second film. Um, what is it in you that drives you to need to achieve across the board, or is it more about the power of the idea and the best way to um, deliver it? I think it? Uh, when I was at art school, I had this inner ambition and I did a double major. No one else did a double major in my year. I did a double major in sculpture and printmaking. So I probably set myself hard tasks. And so when I left um, art school, um, those facilities in printmaking and sculpture weren't available to me. So I started drawing on the kitchen table. And I said to myself, um, if I want to be any good at this game, then I have to be versatile and any opportunity or any project that comes my way, say yes to it. And that's how I got involved with public art because an opportunity presented itself. And I said yes and I thought, well, I'll learn the skills on the job. And mm. so that's where I've learnt to diversify. I, and then I started um, working in the area of photography. I don't take the shots myself, but I construct them and employ a photographer to uh, take the actual photograph. And um, so I thought I wouldn't be limited and I would just um, take on as many um, artistic opportunities that presented. So I've been invited to do set design for Bangara Dance Theatre, uh, for a friend of mine, as another set design uh, for a production called Ochre and Dust. And so it's just like, broadened out and the opportunity came with the State Library of Queensland to do a DVD for one of the reading rooms and I thought I don't have the skill sets but um, I'm going to employ people who know how to do it and I'm really grateful that I face these um, this sort of trepidation in the beginning and then get involved in the process and then it's no longer a mystery. Mm. So the second time I'm working on this new f film um, some of it will be, I'll understand it, the process a lot better. And as I get, branch into that area more and more with my career, um, I think I'll be making better work as time comes, comes along. Mm, it certainly does seem to get stronger and deeper every single year. I imagine that every, every year, every month, every day is different for you as an artist, depending on which projects you're working on. Um, how does that feel when you wake up every day? Do you kind of know what you're going to be doing? <laughs> no, I don't. So like some days are really, really busy and then other days I'm at, at a loose end and I don't know how to occupy my time. But this year has been amazing. I've had a lot of public speaking engagements and so I've had to read and research for those and, you know, think about things that I want to present in the public arena. Uh, each day is different. I can never predict it, you know. So mm. some days are really slow, no emails, no one loves me. <laughs> and then other days are just off the dial. And the film crew yeah. arrives. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right.